Welcome into the 504 tonight. You know, in an interview with The Guardian, actor Michael Douglas recently opened up about his battle with throat cancer, which started really a national discussion about oral cancers and specifically about HPV. In fact, it was a topic on the CBS show The Talk just this week, and our very own Angela Hill weighed in with her thoughts. That's and there are important. millions of people who have HPV. Yes, yes. millions very of people. Common. Very, very common. And my beloved sister, who is a sex educator in college, called me and said, Angela, people die. And we have to remember, yes, sex is great, we love it, but we have to be smart. Mm -hmm. I think he's just like Angela and Jolene. He started the conversation. Now, oral cancer is only one of several cancers that can be caused by HPV, which has, believe it or not, infected most of the people who have ever been sexually active. And many of those people have no idea that they have it. That's why Dr. Christy Valentine of the Valentine Medical Center is joining us tonight to talk about the important information that people need to know. And you said because of this Michael Douglas announcement, you've seen a change in the patients who are coming in your office. Yes, absolutely. This week alone, after he made that announcement, we've had several men come into the office, new patients, had not been seen by a physician in years, and they had complaints that they were concerned about that they kind of just brushed off. Well, Michael Douglas, bringing this to the forefront, actually brought them into the office, and that's why this is so important. Uh, that people do connect themselves back to their health care and get out there and get checked. Did you end up finding any serious cases of those men? Well, we're still working them up because mm -hmm. this is stuff that it does need further investigation. Now, sometimes common things happen commonly. And a, a person that comes in with a sore throat, it could very well be a viral pharyngitis or right. a strep throat. But, you know, I think that anything that brings a person in to have it checked is very important. So, yet yeah, some people come in and they had common things, but then others really had something that needed more, more insight and more um, investigation. It's definitely a scare and it will definitely bring out the hypochondriac in you. <laughs> now, what percentage of HPV cases do actually lead to cancer, whether it be oral or any other type of cancer? Well, th that's a number that may be more difficult to pinpoint because people can have HPV and not necessarily know it. They can have the infection and clear the infection. So the exact number they figure, maybe about 7% can lead to actual cancer. But people, this is a large... But that's if it's not found and detected early. Yes. Then it, then it leads to cancer. Yes. Because most of these are preventable cancers, yes, if not they all. Are. They are preventable. And that's why it's important to really get people out there and talking. And we're going to talk more about HPV uh, throughout the night tonight. But I do want to focus on the oral cancer first because you mentioned you're having a lot of people come in your office yes. after this announcement was made. And many people think that oral cancer is rare, but it's, it's really not as rare as people think. No, it's not rare, unfortunately. Tens of thousands of people are actually diagnosed with an oral cancer every year. And every day, people actually die from this. So that's why it is important to make sure that you do pay attention to your body. And if you have a lesion or a symptom that you're concerned about, that you do come in and get it tested. What percentage of HPV cancers would you say are oral cancers? Uh, HPV cancers that are oral cancers? Well, we're looking at the numbers right now, and you're going to get to the point in 2020 looking proactively that about half of them will be HPV related and they're anticipating that actually half of cancers will be HPV related oral half cancers can or half of oral yeah, cancers oral right. cancers and so actually in 2020 they're anticipating that the number of cervical cancers will be um, you'll actually have more HP re HPV related oral cancers than cervical cancer and your brand, I know that, that we're going to talk about the cervical cancer in women too, but mm -hmm. you're bringing up the numbers. Let's take a look at the numbers nationally and locally because it looks like that we are in line here in Louisiana with the national numbers. Well, yes, um, in Louisiana, but if you look at the numbers, males at 7.22% uh, is actually a little higher than little what higher, it is yeah. in the nation for males uh, where it's only 6.2%. And then the females um, in Louisiana, the cancers linked to HPV, it's actually a little lower than that. So I think now, especially in our areas, we have more than the national average for HPV linked cancers in men than nationally. And that, that was just for oral cancer. Yes, and we, just of course, have a lot more to talk about. How long does it usually take of having HPV to cause cancer? 
a person can have HPV for 20 years. And this is something that a person in their and 50s... And not know? And not know it. They, they won't know it because it can be very, very... It can kind of whisper symptoms to, to a patient where it's not something that they um, may go to the doctor for. And just looking at Michael Douglas, he had discomfort for months before this was actually identified. So a man or a woman in their 50s and 60s is usually when this is identified, but it is something that it can take a long time for the cancer to really develop. Now you mentioned it 20 years in Michael Douglas's case, he had that discomfort for several years. When he was diagnosed, he was already in stage four. Yes. And, and that's oftentimes terminal. It is. What's the survival rate if you were to find cancer, if you've had no symptoms mm -hmm. of HPV, you discover you have cancer, you're in stage four, what's the survival rate at that point? Well, of course, the earlier you find the cancer, the better the survivor, survival, 80 to 90% that find the cancer early can actually survive the infection. The good thing with HPV related head and neck cancers is that once you treat that, you do have a higher rate of remission. Mm -hmm. So it is- and You're talking about in the first stage or first and second stages? Even with, in Michael Douglas's case, the fact that now he is in remission for his cancer, the fact that it was HPV related would make that more common. So you have the HPV-related cancers, but they're more treatable, and people respond well to the treatment. Now, for those who do have symptoms, let's take a look at the list of symptoms, beginning with uh, sore throat. Right, sore throat, and that's what brought patients into my office with these complaints. They may have trouble swallowing or the feeling that something is caught in their throat. A lot of times, people might just have a change in the color on their tonsils where it might be a white patch or a red patch and that'll bring them in because would you feel that at all well you would feel the discomfort and maybe that it's kind of scratchy mm -hmm. and that's the complaint that people will have they may have jaw or ear pain numbness or pain in the tongue and that's what michael douglas experienced more just that pain in his tongue uh, change in your voice such as hoarseness or a lump or sore that doesn't heal when you mentioned the white or red patch on your tonsils would, would that be different from or, or in your mouth, would that be different from just an ulcer? That because I get stressed out, I get ulcers. Yeah. You know, but because this is so scary, uh, is it? Can you specify if that's any different? Well, not necessarily. You know, you can have one that's persistent though. And like you said, if you a person that you know particular situations, you might get an ulcer on your tonsils, mm -hmm. but it goes away. And mm -hmm. so you have that period so this where it wouldn't go will, away. It would not okay. go away. Okay. And and Michael Douglas, he had a lesion under his tongue for a long time before ah. it was actually identified. Okay. So this isn't something that kind of will come and go. It's something that persists, and that's when you want to bring that up with your doctor. Now, since we're talking about oral cancer, it's not only caused by HPV. So we did want to mention right. the other reasons or the other causes of oral cancer. Tobacco use, I know, is a huge cause. Tobacco use is, and also it depends on the number of cigarettes that you smoke. So the more cigarettes you smoke, the higher your risk of getting an oral cancer. Um, but tobacco, including cigarettes, cigars, pipes, chewing tobacco, and snuff, uh, heavy alcohol use is also related to oral cancer. And if you drink and smoke a lot of cigarettes, then that also increases your risk even more so. A diet lacking in fruits and vegetables, and then of course, as we mentioned, the sexually transmitted HPV. What's the most common cause? The most common cause would be the the cigarettes. You Cigarette. know, cigarettes, cigarettes, even, even more than to the chew. Well, all the tobacco products, you're not going to find one that's better than the other. Okay. Even though people really want, you know, want to identify the one that may be the best. Mm -hmm. You cutting back on cigarettes, even if you go from a pack a day to a half a pack a day. I celebrate that with my patients because it takes a lot of work. Okay. We're going to be right back with Dr. Valentine, and we will continue this conversation talking about Gardasil, the controversial uh, vaccine for girls, whether the boys should take it as well, because now it is approved for the guys to take that also. And we're going to talk more about specific symptoms of HPV in general, in general when we return.
Well, statistics show that most people who have ever been sexually active have contracted the human papillomavirus, and many people have no idea. Dr. Christy Valentine of the Valentine Medical Center is joining us with the dangers that this presents, really, for our whole society. And HPV, you were telling me, is a group of more than 100, really, viruses. Uh, what are the most common strains? Well, the most common for the genital warts are 6 and 11, HPV 6 and 11. But for the cancers, most commonly are HPV 16 and 18. Now, are they all only transferred through sex? They're transferred from skin to skin transmission. So a lot of that is the sexual contact that will give people the infection. But I have had questions just this week on if I go to a public restroom, am I at risk? Mm -hmm. Or what about if I'm at a, a public place and sit on a, a sofa that I'm not familiar with? And the answer with that is no. That's not, it is a skin to skin transmitted infection. But is it only um, in areas that you would use during sexual intercourse? Or, yes. or what about kissing? Can you get it from kissing? Well, technically, you could get it from kissing, um, especially depending on, on the kiss. So any sexual contact can bring on an infection with the virus. So you really need to know. Right. It brings who up is that conversation. Infected. Yeah. Yes. And, and sometimes you don't even know that you're infected. You don't. You may not know that you're infected, but I think that what is really important with this and the fact that this is um, brought to light now is that people have to have that difficult conversation. Mm -hmm. They have to find out more about their sexual partner and mm -hmm. the person that they are planning a physical relationship with. That's something that we've always stressed in the medical community and people still shy away from actually bringing that up because they don't want to insult the person that they're, they're in a relationship with. Now, about 15 types, you say, of HPV are associated with the increased risk in cancer. And since there are so many strains that show no symptoms at all, are, uh, first of all, do every, does every type of HPV have the possibility of not showing any symptoms? A lot, yes. The, you can have any type of HPV infection and not have a symptom, something that you're, you're not aware of, absolutely. And that's why it is important to get screened and test, tested with your physician. Because that's it, the screening test, it will pick up an infection that you may not even be aware of. And the most common symptom, I guess, or the most visible would be the warts? Yes, and that's something that your doctor, you go, you go in. And you that's have, only a certain strain of HPV. Well, yeah, they have certain strains yeah. that are, they're the lower risk for um, versions of the virus. And yes, they do cause the genital warts. And your doctor can see that, and usually we can diagnose that just on the appearance of the lesion. Is that pretty much just uh, a, a, well, if you have the warts, that's usually not the same strain that causes the cancer, is that exactly. right? Exactly, okay. exactly. Now, if you have a wart, but you don't have HPV, is there a way to tell the difference? Because you know, lots of people have warts, right? And, right? and that's not always HPV, right? Right. But I guess you should always get it checked anyway. You should, and, and it is important to have that to have that check. Is there a certain age group that seems to be prevalent uh, to report cases of HPV? Sexually active individuals. So y this is why, you know, we really like to educate the children, get them in early before they are sexually active. But it's that age group where people are having more of that skin-to-skin -skin, um, contact that would put them at risk. And on that note, let's talk about getting it diagnosed early, particularly uh, in women. They need to start by, of course, visiting their doctor. Right, and just that physical exam that I was uh, mentioning earlier where just on examination, we'd be able to tell you if you did have a lesion that looked like a wart or something that should um, be treated. Mm -hmm. Then there's also the vinegar solution test, the pap test that we, you know, most women are very familiar with, and a swab that could do a DNA test for a patient. But you brought up the pap test. Uh, well, let's talk about that. I'll, I'll go back to the pap test, but since we have this up too, let's talk about the possibilities of diagnosing it in men because I know there are no HPV tests for men like there are for women. Exactly. Since there are no tests, that's why it is important to call your doctor if you see something that um, you may have that's concerning. Uh, and then you want to seek treatment if a partner um, tells you that they do have an, an infection. And that's something that I know we talk to patients about all the time is actually reporting um, whatever they have 
to their partners. And that's something that I think a lot of patients are, are very vo vocal about. They're, they are wanting to give that information to their partner so they can be treated. Now, if you're a woman who has your regular pap smear mm -hmm. once a year and you think you're staying on top of everything, that doesn't mean that you've been tested for HPV or you would know through the pap smear, correct? You have to have a special test for that. Yes, and a lot of times when the pap test is performed, we do send it as well for um, HPV screening, but they have changed the recommendations for when women should have pap screens. And before it was when you became sexually active. Now it's actually at 21 years of age because mm -hmm. what we found were a lot of women were having procedures um, that could uh, jeopardize fertility later on, mm -hmm. say. Um, they were having these procedures and then it wasn't to necessary. To treat? Yes. To treat HPV. To treat okay. HPV. But they would clear that infection on their own. Mm -hmm. So now it's recommended that you get a PAP every three years um, and start at the age of 21. Okay. Uh, we also want to briefly talk about the prevent, the ways to prevent, uh, which are, you know, you can't say enough practice safe sex, of course, right. get regularly, regularly tested, as you've right. been mentioning, and the Gardasil shot or the other, there's a new one, right? A yes. New, a new vaccine, too. And we're going to talk more in detail about those ways to prevent HPV and also what do you do if you think you have it and what your options are for treatment when we return. Dr. Christy Valentine of the Valentine Medical Center is joining us tonight on the 504 talking about an extremely important topic, unfortunately, extremely common, HPV among people who are sexually active. It's, I guess, been contracted in, I think, about 75% of people who have been sexually active, and a lot of those have no idea. Let's talk about the vaccinations because those have been controversial in itself. Why is that? Well, a lot of parents, they are concerned and really resistant to vaccinate their children against a sexually transmitted disease, um, HPV. And so it's one of those things that you have the conversation with the parent, you address the, the questions, and you tell them this is a, a vaccination that could prevent a cancer for your child later on. Well, let, let's talk about this, Dr. Valentine, because of course you have the argument that giving the child a vaccination for mm -hmm. to, to prevent an STD when the child is 9, 10, 11, 12 years right. old is just going to encourage that child to have sex earlier in life because there are parents who feel that way. Mm -hmm. And that is the recommended age to give the vaccine, I know Gardasil at least, early on in life. Right. But then there's also concerns about side effects. So what can you tell us about side effects of Gardasil and also the other new vaccine? Okay, well, as far as the side effects, the most common is a local site reaction where the injection just is from the shot. just from getting the shot, it's painful, it hurts, and they've, people have reported that across the country. So it's one of those things that, you know, how you say it's so, it's a pinprick. Well, patients who I've had that take shots without any problems, they've had a problem taking this injection. Um, now, I think though, as far as if it encourages sexual activity, I'm not so sure about that because if that all goes into the education. You're mm -hmm. telling them that this is going to prevent a cancer later on. That's what you tell them when they're, they're really young. And then you encourage that conversation. But you want to actually have the child vaccinated before they're sexually active and considering those relationships. Certainly. And we should mention that those vaccinations are only for HPV. They're still such a wide variety of other sexually transmitted diseases as well. Right. That, uh, that do not prevent. Now, which one do you recommend? Well, the one that we use is Gardasil. That actually um, protects against HPV 6, 11, 16, and 18. And 6 and 11, as I mentioned, are the ones that actually prevent the, um, they can cause the genital warts. But now you mentioned that the biggest side effect would be just redness at the, yeah. at the site of the mm -hmm. shot. What about long-term possible side effects? Because how long has the, the vaccine been around? Gardasil was the oldest, right? Yeah, Gardasil is the oldest. And right now they anticipate, and this is just because this is the studies that have been done, that you get about eight years of protect, protection. But since this is relatively new, they are projecting that this is something that's going to take ongoing studies and research. So right now the vaccine is good for about eight years of protection. And it, it just protection, came but you don't really know about long-term side effects until it's been around that long. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a chance. It is, it is a question that parents have, but no, before the FDA 
releases, any medication or vaccination out into the public. It's been extensively researched. But you know, as well as I do, yeah. there have been lots of cases where there have been at long after long-term benefits have, or, or long-term side effects have been seen they've pulled it off the market and that's why parents are right. really concerned about this all right let's talk about uh, if you do have HPV ways to treat it yes well are there ways to treat it there are and it depends on the infection that you have so if you do have genital warts your doctor will give you treatment for that and that may be um, that you'll have a cream that you'll have to apply like an amiquamide or you might have to freeze um, the wart. It just depends because you have the warts, they can either stay there, they can get larger or they could even go away. So it's something you'd want to monitor. And what about cervical cancer? Well, cervical cancer, your gynecologist will work with you with that. And it may be that you'll need the, the lesion um, surgically removed and have a partial hysterectomy, or sometimes people even need um, chemo and radiation to treat that cancer. So it can be pretty extreme. It can be. It can be. And that's why it is, you, you can understand where the importance of a vaccine, something to prevent women going through that um, becomes important but you're right everything you look at risk versus benefit and how old do you have to be to, the, to get the vaccine because it's only effective in younger people right well it is and the earliest age that, that is approved right now is nine years of age where it's recommended around 11 and 12 mostly but you can start as early as, as nine years and up to 26 and that's for men and women um, 26 years of age now of course Depending on your individual situation, your doctor may recommend that even beyond that age, you get the series of three vaccines. All right, some great information tonight. Thanks so much, Dr. Christy Valentine, for joining us tonight. And we'll be right back to tell you what's coming up tomorrow on the show. Tomorrow on the 504, retiring New Orleans Fire Chief Charles Parent opens up about the issues he's faced as superintendent and advice he has for the next chief. And tell us what you think about tonight's show on Twitter or Facebook. That's it for tonight. We'll see you here tomorrow.